I've been working on for a while. And this webinar series gives me get, has given me an opportunity to really dive into it. Uh, this is my first presentation of this research, so I'll be very grateful for feedback and thoughts. I know I'm not alone in thinking that human images, and especially very stylized or schematic human images, are some of the most engaging parts of the archaeological record. And, and part of the reason that they're so engaging is because they're so enigmatic. You know, when we look at these, our imagination goes wild with the uh, upper Paleolithic Venuses or rock art or figurines from the Neolithic as people were getting used to living in these larger, more permanent communities. And in research on the Paleolithic and Neolithic, a lot of work has gone into trying to explain this human imagery and put these images in their context, um, and also to engage seriously with the, with the concept of ambiguity, and especially gender ambiguity as not accidental, but as purposeful. Um, this idea has been pretty rarely touched on in the Roman world. The, with one big exception, and that's um, work by Miranda Althouse Green. Uh, she discusses ambiguity in Iron Age and Roman imagery uh, from the Celtic region, and she interprets it very symbolically. Uh, she argues that sex and gender ambiguous human images were symbols meant to convey the concept of boundary crossing or liminality. But she also makes the point that interpreting ambiguity is a, is a tough road to go down. She's got this great quote at the beginning of um, her 1997 article, uh, Images in Opposition, which is, ambiguous and ambivalent things are hard to understand unambiguously. And I agree, but I, I also agree that it's worth it to try. And that's my goal in this talk, uh, taking a group of sex and gender ambiguous human images from Roman Gaul and interpreting that ambiguity within its context, guided by Miranda Althouse Green, but also by the insights of researchers interpreting sex and gender ambiguity in more ancient contexts, especially in the European and the Middle Eastern Neolithic. So the material that I'm talking about is healing votives from Roman Gaul. And these were offerings shaped like the body of the offer of the entire body or a body part of the offer and offered at a healing sanctuary in the hopes of getting healing out of it. Um, and there's an incredible diversity in Gallo-Roman healing votives um, in the body parts represented. So uh, we have arms and eyes and legs and sex organs and internal organs. And we also have um, heads or entire bodies. Um, but they're also diverse in other ways, so including the size of them. So all the way from, you know, half size or three quarter size um, to, uh, you know, just a, just a few centimeters tall. And then they're also pretty diverse in the materials. So they show up in stone and in carved wood, um, but also in cut bronze sheets. And some of the most expensive votives may have been specially commissioned, but the majority were probably purchased from craftspeople selling them at the sanctuaries. And it's also possible that some were made by the offers themselves. And, some, and in the healing votives, there are some body parts that can't be gendered, so arms and legs and feet and eyes and that sort of thing. But many can be ascribed to sex or a gender based on the part of the body it is, especially heads and entire bodies and torsos. Um, my focus today, though, is on votives that are of types that could be gendered, so those heads, entire bodies, and torsos, uh, but they aren't. The first thing that I'd like to prove is that this ambiguity was purposeful. It wasn't just incidental, and it wasn't because those features suggesting sex or gender didn't preserve. And the reason this matters is because ambiguity is itself meaningful and functional. So I'd like to show how this is the case by talking about the meaning and function of ambiguity in these healing votives in this dynamic colonial context of Roman Gaul. So I'd like to talk about meaning with respect to understandings of gender and gender identity, especially as it conflicts with those understandings in Rome itself. And then I'll talk about function as it relates to the negotiation of this colonial context. 
So all the sanctuaries that produced these ambiguous votives are in the northern areas of Gaul. Um, and in fact, almost all healing votives in general that have been found in Gaul are from these northern areas with very few um, found in the southern area um, at all. And actually, I want to point out that offering healing votives wasn't a practice in Gaul until after the Roman conquest. Uh, so some forms of healing votives in Gaul do closely follow after Italic healing votive forms, but the practice had been declining in popularity in Italy for at least a century by this point. You know, nobody really offered anatomical votives in Italy by the time that Rome conquered. And I'd like to show a few healing sanctuaries briefly, just to give a sense of the diversity of the sites in which these objects were offered. So I'll show the three that produced the largest number of gender ambiguous votives, but also the largest number of votives in general. So the first site is the site of Chamalier, and this isn't an actual picture of the site, but it gives a good sense of what it would have actually looked like when it was a sanctuary. Um, so there was no architecture except possibly just a, a short wooden fence and people would have placed their healing votives either on the side of this spring or directly into the water. Sort of on the other side of the end of the spectrum, we've got the sanctuary at Source de la Seine, and it's named that because it's actually at the source of the river Seine. And um, it may have been in a sanctuary in the late Iron Age before Roman conquest, but this architecture is all uh, Roman period architecture. And then sort of in the middle of the two, we've got this, uh, the sanctuary at Forêt de Lat, which is sort of this classically uh, Gallo-Roman sanctuary style with a, with a temple set inside of a, a walled enclosure. So like I was saying just a minute ago, healing votives are pretty diverse in terms of the body parts represented, the material they're represented in um, and all that but I'm especially interested for this project in the range of styles that's represented. Um, and to give a sense of that range of styles, all of the votives on this slide are from one sanctuary, Source de la Seine, and they range from these really highly detailed and naturalistic votives to more stylized and even to highly schematic and undetailed, sort of along the lines of stick figures. Um, and I wanna point out that this level of diversity is actually the norm within sanctuaries. All sanctuaries that have a large enough uh, body of healing votives have this level of stylistic diversity at them. And this is important because the gender ambiguity, that's my focus, always accompanies stylized or schematic representations. Uh, I noted earlier that most of these votives were probably purchased from craftspeople at sanctuaries, but some people may have uh, made their own offerings. They, some of them may have been homemade. And given the level of schematization of some of these gender ambiguous votives, it may be the case that a higher proportion of these ambiguous votives were homemade. Uh, though given the range of styles in, this, in these ambiguous votives, I, I think it's very likely that gender ambiguous votives were among those available for purchase at sanctuaries as well. And all these votives on this slide are gender ambiguous, but I'll note that while all gender ambiguous votives are stylized to, to a degree by, by nature, by definition, all stylized votives aren't gender ambiguous. There are plenty of votives in this uh, schematized or stylistic uh, manner that sh do show indications of sex or gender. And my focus is on why people offer gender ambiguous healing votives. Uh, one answer might be, you know, it wasn't for a purpose. It's just that the maker didn't think to add those details or they were, they were made by really unskilled artists who couldn't manage it. But the evidence does suggest that it was purposeful, not accidental or incidental. And I'll pre present the evidence for that now, but first I want to define the critical terms here. So when I refer to sex, I mean the, the genetically determined state, so female or male or intersex. And when I say gender, on the other hand, I mean the, the culturally specific set of values and behaviors that accompany an identity. And sex and gender are clearly interrelated, right? And, and gender identity very often correlates with biological sex, but they are separate. And the reason this is important is because of how I define ambiguity itself. 
Some literature on sex and gender and prehistoric human imagery uses ambiguous to refer to a state of being both male and female or somewhere between the two. So it's used to describe dual sexed or herm hermaphroditic representations. I use the more colloquial definition of unclear or having more than one possible meaning. And more technically, when I assign a votive as ambiguous, I mean that there's no indication of sex or gender. And I say sex or gender because sex and gender are represented differently. So in terms of representing sex, what we're looking for is sex specific traits, right? So uh, for females, breasts or vulva, for male, penis or often facial hair is common. Uh, representing gender though, isn't about body parts, but about culturally specific markers of gender identity. Uh, the best way I've found to study those markers of gender in Roman Gaul is looking at tombstones. Uh, so features indicating men would be uh, short hair, a tunic that falls to just below the knee. Um, a lot of men are depicted wearing this hooded cape. Um, and then a lot of times there's a depiction of something sort of bunchy around the neck, like a scarf. Uh, and I wanna point out that um, you can show these features still pretty clearly, even with a less detailed representation. So here, this. This, this tombstone is clearly a, a representation of a man because he's got this uh, tunic to blow the knee and, and a scarf or something like that around his neck. Uh, features indicating women, on the other hand, so uh, they tend to have long hair or some sort of updo or, or a veiled head sometimes. And they tend to not be shown wearing that um, Gallic cape, but they do have a shawl or a cloak wrapped around them a lot of the time. And unlike the men's tunic that goes to just below the knee, theirs tends to go uh, to just the ankle. And uh, women are often shown, or sometimes at least in these uh, tombstones, shown wearing jewelry, especially necklaces, uh, but sometimes earrings as well. Um, but the larger point here is that all those differences have to do either with the hair or with clothing. And so men and women dress differently and did their hair differently. So for the purposes of this study, I assume that those figures that display clothing or hair, even if uh, the clothing or hair are so stylized that it's difficult or impossible to determine gender from it, weren't meant to be ambiguous. You know, if somebody was making an offering that had a depiction of clothing or a depiction of hair, even if we can't tell what, the, uh, what gender that offering was, they meant to have that offering be gendered. So purposeful ambiguity means those representations that we can clearly see details like facial features. So the features are clearly preserved, uh, but there are still no indications of sex or gender. And I'd argue that this is actually a very conservative way to define ambiguity. You know, it's completely possible, for example, that a line representing hair might have been symbolically non gender to the people making the votives. My argument is that ambiguity, so not representing sex or gender, uh, was purposeful and not just incidental or because somebody was a bad artist. Um, and the most important reason is because representing both sex and gender is very easy. So in terms of representing sex, for example, you know, I chose, I chose this modern graffiti example because it, it, it's so helpfully labeled for us, um, but you can find pretty much identical uh, penis graffiti in ancient Rome, right? Um, if you want to turn a smiley face into a, a male smiley face, it's pretty easy to add a mustache. Or, you know, another example of graffiti for, for female anatomy, right? This, uh, it's, it's very easy to do this. In terms of representing gender, you know, the way we represent gender is symbolic and we learn those symbols as part of our cultural lexicon and they are culturally specific. Not, not everybody on earth shares the same symbols for men and women, um, but these culturally specific symbols do indicate gender to us. And those symbols can be very basic and still completely legible. So a, a good sign, of, a good example of that would be bathroom signs, right? So. Uh, we look at this and very clearly see uh, women and men, um, but it's not a it's not a complex symbolic system here. Um, and I want to point out that 
you, these symbols are in fact culturally specific. You know, I sort of wonder if an ancient Roman would would look at this these symbols and say, oh, that one on the left is a man wearing a tunic, right? <laughs> So it's very easy to represent sex and gender. And people did, in fact, represent both sex and gender with very basic methods and their votives. So, so here on, on the left, this is clearly a, a man because his tunic goes to just below his knees. Or in the middle, we have a, a female represented because we have a representation of breasts. And also, we see her hair up here, I suppose. Um, and then on the right, uh, it's hard to know what gender is being represented here. Um, but the, the hair is clearly, um, is clearly shown. So clearly, so, so I wouldn't mark this one as ambiguous. So in terms of the actual assemblage of ambiguous votives, um, there are only three sites that had more than a couple of these, but eight sanctuaries overall and across that Northern Gallic region um, have produced these ambiguous votives. So in this table, I have in the center column, the number of votives I've categorized as ambiguous. Um, and then in this uh, right column is the percent of votives that are ambiguous out of those types that can be gendered. So heads and bodies and torsos, but not um, arms and legs and hands and eyes and that sort of thing. And I want to note that ambiguous votives are a pretty small proportion of the healing votives overall, though at Halat, the, the, the proportion goes up to 17% here. So most of the ambiguous votives are heads, um, almost two thirds of them, but entire figures are relatively common too. And those are, you know, votives that the whole body is represented, but still no indication of sex or gender. And then stacked heads and torso and leg combinations are um, both, both relatively uncommon at the same level. So by stacked heads, I mean, you know, heads either one on top of each other or side by side. And um, this is a pretty stylized way to represent uh, the human form anyway, but some do show indications of gender. It's just that these six don't. And in terms of the, these torso and legs, um, most of the time when we see um, votives of this form, they do show clear indications of sex. So the ones that don't seem significant. And I wanna point out that I used a standard method to categorize votives as gender ambiguous. So no indications of sex specific traits and no indications of hair or clothing. And in doing so, I found several instances where the votive had been categorized by the original researchers as gendered despite having none of those indications. Um, and most of those that were gendered despite having none of those indications were assigned as male. And I think this says something valuable about how we as researchers interpret this absence of features. You know, we're more likely to default to male than to female when we see this ambiguity. I also want to point out that I noted three dual sex representations in the, in, in the data set of healing votives. So showing both male and female traits, two from Source de la Seine and one from Foray de Lat. And actually the Halat one was categorized as male by the original researchers, though tentatively. Um, and you know, these weren't common in the data set, but since we're talking about um, diversity and how gender and sexuality are or aren't represented, these feel valuable to mention. So ambiguity wasn't the most common choice at any sanctuary, but this practice wasn't limited to just one or two sanctuaries. We see gender ambiguous imagery at sanctuaries across the region and continuing for a long time into the Roman period. So why? How do we interpret this ambiguity in the context of Gallo-Roman healing sanctuaries? This brings us to the next important piece of my argument, which is that ambiguity is itself meaningful and functional. In his analysis of figurines from the Balkan Neolithic, uh, uh, Bailey calls this sort of schematization of the human body representational absence. And he argues that leaving out body parts in these representations, so including uh, sex specific body parts, but also other body parts, um, that, that wasn't a passive choice. Instead, we should think of this as an active choice that was meant to convey an idea. So in other words, the ambiguity is the point. And 
Bailey argues that a value of ambiguity is that absence draws our attention and causes us to fill the vacuum with our own interpretations. And that's interpretations plural. Uh, this ambiguity, this representational absence, uh, lends itself to multiple interpretations simultaneously. And that's exactly what I'll do uh, for the rest of this uh, talk, you know, put forward multiple interpretations for these ambiguous healing motives. And we can use our knowledge of the context to gauge the likelihood or value of each of these interpretations, but there's no reason to think that just one of these is the right one. There's not one right answer here. These figures could have had different meanings or uses, whether sanctuary by sanctuary or community by community. It's, it's even reasonable to assume that individuals within a community could have interpreted gender ambiguous figures in diverse and personal ways. The more ambiguous the symbol, the, the wider the range of potential meanings. So ambiguity itself is the key here. And I want to talk about two sort of veins of interpretation separately. So first, potential meanings for this ambiguity in Roman Gaul, and then potential functions of this ambiguity. So meaning first, what can these ambiguous motives tell us about understandings of gender or gender identity in Roman Gaul? And this question becomes really loaded and interesting because of Roman Gaul's status as a colonial environment. Uh, in the context of colonial control, Roman gender ideology or values with respect to proper gendered behavior came into contact with a set of Gallic values that was different from their own. You know, it's a given that Roman society was patriarchal with formal control at every level in the hands of men. And the strength of the gender binary kept both men and women in their place by prescribing strict boundaries on proper gender behavior. Uh, when Roman writers talk about the Gauls though, they noted perversions of this proper gender behavior. So men who wore garish amounts of jewelry and habitually slept with other men and women who were quick to join their husbands in a fight. And archaeological evidence does seem to suggest more flexibility in gendered behavior or gender roles in pre-Roman Gaul. It also paints a, a complex picture of the connection between gender and power. Uh, both men and women could hold status and power, but that power was expressed differently. Uh, Pope and Ralston call this a, quote, male to female spectrum of combat to contact. So they argue that men tended to display status through weaponry and women were more likely to, to display status through high value trade goods. So power was gendered, but it wasn't limited to men. Given this context, understanding what happened when Roman gender ideology met Gallic gendered behavior is an important part of the understanding of the colonial dynamic in general. What might these ambiguous figures suggest about how gender was understood in Gaul post-conquest? Some researchers who study more ancient contexts view sex or gender ambiguity in the archaeological record as evidence that sex and gender weren't binary and weren't necessarily connected in those societies. In a past as remote as the Neolithic, there's no textual evidence to guide us in studying how people understood sex and gender, uh, and the evidence we do have is so enigmatic. Uh, Hamilton, who, who studies these prehistoric contexts, argues that maybe sex and gender weren't important to the idea that was being presented by ambiguous figures. She challenges archaeologists to confront our own cultural biases. So just because sex and gender are closely tied and deeply shape society in our, in our own cultures, it doesn't mean that sex and gender structured society in these ancient contexts. And I agree with her to a point, recognizing our own biases is critically important in this. But in the case of Gaul, we do have clarity that sex and gender were important structuring features of society. You know, we know that gender roles existed, even if they were um, a little more fluid, and those roles were generally linked to biological sex. So given this, how should we explain this ambiguous imagery? In her research on Neolithic Greece, Talalai suggests that asexual and dual sex figurines were meant to represent who are considered to be both sexes at once or who could shift from male to female. Uh, Belcher, in her study of the Mesopotamian Halaf culture, argues that stylistically diverse human figurines should be considered evidence for a non-binary spectrum approach to sex and gender in that culture. 
maybe in Gaul, they're evidence of a gender system that was less binary or more open to fluidity. And these ambiguous figures were representative of something like a third gender in Gaul, somebody who is neither a man nor a woman, or maybe both at the same time. In this colonial context, we have to wonder to what extent this distinctly un-Roman way of thinking about gender was a continuation from the pre-Roman period. I already mentioned that evidence suggests that gender roles were more fluid in pre-Roman Gaul than in Rome itself, but it's hard to point to any clear evidence that speaks to fluidity and gender identities. Um, and in every society with a gender binary, there are people who don't fit into that binary. So, it seems to me a given that non-binary people existed in Gaul, and, but these ambiguous motives might be evidence that those identities were more broadly understood or recognized or even formalized. In her book, An Archaeology of Images, Miranda Aldhouse Green points out that even though gender is a universal human construct, plenty of ancient and modern cultures view gender as mutable over the course of a lifetime. So for example, some cultures may think of prepubescent children as not having gender or having a different type of gender from adults. Or once a woman is past childbearing age, her gender might be conceived of differently than a woman who can still bear children. In some societies, gender identities associated with achievement of some level of status or skill. From this perspective, gender ambiguous imagery might be indicative of this sort of understanding in Roman Gaul. So representing individuals who are in a liminal or non-gendered state or time of their lives. What if we ground our interpretations more concretely in the context of healing sanctuaries? At these sanctuaries, some people offered asexual non-gendered images of themselves in the hope of being healed. So what does this say then about humans' relationship with the gods in Gaul? Maybe there was an understanding that the gods didn't care what sex or gender they were, or maybe it was that people assumed the gods would know even if they didn't show it. Even more specifically, what does this ambiguity say about sex and gender's connection with illness in Roman Gaul? In Rome itself, medical understanding was that male and female bodies were fundamentally different and that's what made men naturally superior to women. So men's and women's health complaints stemmed from completely different issues. You know, really any health issue a woman experienced was somehow related to her uterus misbehaving, if you listen to, to the Roman doctors. Um, both male and female body parts were offered at healing sanctuaries in Roman Gaul, but so were these asexual images. And something this may say about Roman Gaul is that illness wasn't as rooted in sex as it was in Rome. So you know, a stomach ache was a stomach ache, regardless of the sex of the sufferer, and the treatment was the same. Or a woman's trouble breathing wasn't necessarily related to where her uterus had traveled in her body. Another piece of evidence for this interpretation may be the complete lack of votive uteruses in Gallo-Roman healing sanctuaries. Now, a uterus was a common anatomical votive in italic healing sanctuaries through most of the Republican period, and here's an example of that. Uh, but not one votive uterus has been found in Roman Gaul. Uh, votives depicting internal organs, uh, yes, plenty, but no uteruses. So those are a few possible interpretations about the meaning of this ambiguity. We can, we can think about these ambiguous images from the perspective of what they suggest about understandings of gender in Roman Gaul. I'd like to move now from meaning to focus on function. And meaning and function are obviously interrelated, but it is helpful to approach them separately. Ambiguity can function in ways that specificity can't. So what did this ambiguity do in Roman Gaul? And let's start with the most context specific potential functions. You know, these figures were specifically healing votives. So, what function might ambiguity have played in people's prayers for healing? Maybe it was a way to maximize anonymity. You know, some people didn't want anybody to know what their health issue was or that they'd visited the sanctuary. So they, they wanted the gods to help them, but they didn't want their neighbors in their business. <laughs> or maybe these ambiguous votives were meant to be a prayer for more than one person. Uh, and the lack of detail was meant for the gods to be able to see multiple people in a single votive. I do also want to talk about ambiguity's function in the broader context of Gaul as a colonial environment. In analyzing decorations on ceramics from the Neolithic Near East, both Campbell and Gibbs observed that compared to earlier periods, 
uh, when decorations were more naturalistic and figurative. During the late Neolithic, ceramic decorations became more abstract and geometric. And they both argue that this abstraction had a function it, because abstract and geometric symbols can be more easily standardized and can be more diversely and complexly interpreted. Abstract geometric motifs could convey ideas across longer distances or allow the more dispersed populations during this period uh, to maintain connections. So symbolic ambiguity can serve a practical function. And this can also be applied to ambiguous human figures. I talked earlier about Bailey's con concept of representational absence. He argues that absence of body parts on human figures allows us to fill those absences with complex and varied meanings. So asexual or non-gendered human figures should be considered ambiguous symbols like the abstract geometric motifs Campbell and Gibbs study on pottery. And some researchers studying human imagery in the Neolithic have seen that how humans were represented changed over time, and that these changes are reflective of the changing functions they served given changes in the natural and social environment. So I'll share a couple of examples to illustrate what I mean. In her study of human figurines in the Aegean, Mina notes that throughout most of the Neolithic, figurines were highly decorated and stylistically quite varied, and asexual representations made up a relatively small proportion. But in the final Neolithic and early Bronze Age, forms became more standardized and decoration decreased and the proportion of asexual figurines increased. Mina argues that the standardization of figures reflects a, a much more standardized definition of societal roles, including gender roles. So because what it meant to be a, a woman or a man was more societally defined in these later periods, more rigid gender roles could be interpreted from ambiguous figurines. Coit and Chesson describe similar changes in human imagery over time in the pre-pottery Neolithic in the Southern Levant. The corpus of human figurines from the earlier pre-pottery Neolithic is pretty small, but the figurines that do exist show obvious male and female characteristics. In the middle of the period, human representations were more commonly were more common and were also more commonly asexual. Quint and Chesson see a similar pattern in mortuary evidence at this time. So there's a very little differentiation in treatment of bodies depending on age or gender or any other clear markers of uh, status. In the late pre-pottery Neolithic, sex characteristics become much more common again. Um, and they argue that changes in human imagery reflected and even supported changes in the commu in community values throughout this time. So in the earlier period, in the early period, in the late period, major community stressors like population growth and resource insecurity meant that people negotiated these challenges with increased social differentiation. But in that middle period, with fewer stressors and more stability, asexual human figures supported the concept of community cohesiveness. So the function of ambiguity is in reflecting and reinforcing societal dynamics and values. So how should we apply this to the colonial context of Rome and Gaul? The one common feature of both Mina's and Quentin Chesson's research is the value of connecting changes in human imagery over time to changes in societal dynamics. So to what extent can we see changes in the frequency of ambiguous figures over time in the healing sanctuaries? It's tough to say because the way votives are often deposited makes them generally pretty difficult to date. So sometimes offerings are placed into springs or wells uh, where they all mix together and no layering is preserved. And sometimes offerings would have been on display at a sanctuary for some length of time before being cleared in a group and placed in a secondary deposit. But we know based on radiocarbon dating and dendrochronology that many of the very earliest healing votives were wood. And then based on sort of very limited stratigraphic and stylistic evidence, bronze and stone votives do seem to become more popular later. So the sanctuary at Source de la Seine was in use until the late fourth century, but dendrochronology shows that the majority of the wooden votives date to just the first hundred years of Roman rule to about 50 CE. 
um, out of the 13 purposefully ambiguous votives from Source de la Seine, nine were made of wood and only four of stone. So that's 3.4% of wooden votives that all come from this early period compared to 1% of stone ones that became more popular later. So this isn't strong evidence for whether ambiguous imagery became less common generally over time across sanctuaries, but it may suggest that it became less common over time at Source de la Seine. And the best explanation here would probably be the most obvious, which is that over time, this distinctly un-Roman style got subsumed by Roman ideals and values. And at that point then, we're actually talking about the function of non-ambiguity. So non-ambiguous, more naturalistic motives reinforcing Roman values or demonstrating Romanness. I do want to note though, that even if it became less common over time, it didn't disappear quickly after Roman conquest. The sanctuary at Foray de Lat produced the largest number of sex and gender ambiguous votives, and that sanctuary wasn't even built until almost 100 years post-conquest. I also want to be clear that I wouldn't classify sex and gender ambiguity as some sort of straightforward survival from the pre-Roman period. You know, this level of schematization and ambiguity isn't something that we see often in pre-Roman art either. You know, most human imagery from the Celtic Iron Age shows detail that suggests sex or gender. So adornment, hair, especially facial hair like mustaches are common. And there are exceptions, but not enough to suggest that the people who chose ambiguous figures in the Roman period did it because it was symbolic of the traditions of their ancestors. That doesn't mean though that people weren't making a statement about indigeneity. You know, these figures are clearly not striving for any sort of Roman aesthetic. Uh, Style-wise, the Roman ideal was naturalism, whereas sex and gender ambiguous motives are by definition not striving for naturalism. So we're looking at distinctly un-Roman representations of the body. And when I say un-Roman, I don't necessarily mean survival or continuation of Iron Age style. I really mean alternative to Roman, which because of the colonial environment was a loaded choice that by nature of contrast with Rome connotes indigeneity. The reason this is such a critical point is because of the extent to which colonialism acts on the body. Uh, and this is part of a much broader conversation on the biopolitics or biopower of settler colonialism. But my point is pretty straightforward, which is that Roman colonialism was inseparable from physical violence, in, including gendered physical violence, which we got an excellent and, and chilling example of in last month's webinar with Kelsey Madden's work on sex trafficking and rape as conquest in Roman colonialism. The colonizer needs to physically control the colonized, so the body becomes a major site at which colonialism acts. Because of this, though, the body is also a site uniquely useful for expressing difference. There's power in presenting yourself like the colonizer or, or very much separate from or somewhere in between. And we should interpret potential functions for these ambiguous motives with this in mind. One function could have been negotiation between disparate identities. So clothing is a major marker of identity, including ethnic or political identity. Avoiding depicting clothing altogether, which is something gender ambiguity accomplishes, is a pretty canny way to negotiate this issue in such a loaded environment. So for example, for the most part, researchers agree that Roman styles never gained much traction in Gaul. And this would mean that for anybody who did decide to dress like a Roman, the statement was all the more powerful. Or as another example earlier, I showed examples of the uh, Gallic coat and cloak for women or that hooded cape for men. And that Gallic ensemble wasn't a holdover from the pre-Roman period. It actually started to be worn across Gaul post-conquest, actually supplanting more local ethnic variations in dress though some people did continue to wear those local styles long into the Roman period. Studies of imagery on tombstones by scholars including Maureen Carroll and Ursula Roth suggest that decisions about the identity portrayed with clothing differed based on gender. So for example, in some contexts, women are depicted more often in local ethnic styles while men take up a Roman look. 
Uh, here, for example, is a tombstone depicting Menemon and her husband, I think, uh, Lucis. And Menemon is wearing this local Trevoran ensemble that people wore pre-conquest as well, but her husband is wearing that new Gallic style that only became popular uh, post-conquest and was more interregional. So when it comes to ambiguous votive representations, refusing to depict sex, gender, and clothing may have been a way to negotiate this complex environment and avoid making a statement that some may have seen as problematic or troubling. So there's one possible function. Here's another, maybe for some, it wasn't about negotiating identities, but asserting a clearly non-Roman identity in response to encroaching Roman cultures and values. Maybe it was a way to say, I don't want to represent myself in any way similar to the way they do. I don't want anybody to confuse me for Roman or Romanized. Or, and this is more of a stretch, but certainly interesting to think about, you know, I reject the rigidity in gender roles or the more rigid gender binary that Rome brought with it. I, I don't see the world in that way. So interpretations like these treat healing votives as extensions of the bodies of those who offered them. So they, like the body, become a potential site of colonial control, but also a site of negotiation of or resistance to that control. So to sum up, what we're looking at here is people participating in a practice that didn't exist before Roman conquest, you know, offering healing votives shaped like their bodies. Um, and in doing that, they're choosing a style that references a non-Roman or indigenous identity. This level of ambiguity wasn't a common choice at most sanctuaries, but it existed at sanctuaries throughout the region and pers persisted for a long time. The humans represented in Gallo-Roman healing votives show so much diversity in style, in the parts of the body represented, in the level of specificity or ambiguity present. People chose to display their identities in very different ways in these sanctuaries, and ambiguity was one of those choices. So who chose ambiguity and for what reasons? Uh, did the choice about ambiguous or not depend on the specific health problem that was being addressed? or on the individual's gender identity at that point in their life, or maybe on who else might see it or on making a political statement. What we know about ambiguity is that it lends itself to multiplicity. I've suggested multiple interpretations, but I don't think that just one is right. Ambiguity by its nature can hold multiple meanings or serve different purposes. I think probably different people had different reasons for choosing this option. And taking ambiguity seriously means being comfortable with this multiplicity, you know, suggesting interpretations based on deep understandings of the sociopolitical context, but allowing different and maybe even divergent interpretations to occupy space together. Ambiguity is messy, but that's part of what makes it powerful. And considering these powerful images gives us a unique window into this complex colonial environment. Thank you very much for listening. I'll, I'll be really interested to hear your thoughts.